Okay, thank you, Deb, for coming in. Uh, we're here today. I'm Carol Wallenau. I'm interviewing Deb Lewin for the uh, Roots to Boots project for the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And I'd like to welcome you uh, for this interview today. Deb, this is part of uh, a process where we're interviewing individuals that have uh, emigrated to Dallas from South Africa or countries surrounding the area. And um, I'd like to ask you first if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the ancestral family, the people who might have come prior to your parents from um, Europe into the area of South Africa or the African continent where they may have come from in Europe, a little bit about their history and their past. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it goes back a long time. Let me see. Um, my mom's father uh, was born in South Africa. My grandmother, that would be my grandfather, my, grandfather, my grandmother was born in England. Um, prior to that, her parents actually from Russia, and they all came out as children to uh, what was then Rhodesia and to neighboring country of Portuguese East Africa. And my great-grandfather on the Riga side was um, a caretaker of the, the synagogue in uh, Mozambique, in um, Maputo, which was Lorenzo Marx. And my grandparents got married and had two, two daughters, of which the oldest was my mother. And um, she got married and we had grew up with five children in Rhodesia. And what about on your father's side? My birth father's side, I think they came from Rhode Island. I'm not exactly sure of, of the heritage there. I was just a few weeks old and um, the man that raised me, his name is John Lewin, he's from Poland and his parents came out when he was just three or four years old to Rhodesia at the time. To Rhodesia. And how did your uh, mother meet the man that actually raised you as a father? They met through some mutual friends within the Jewish community in, uh, in Rhodesia. He was divorced and had two children and my mom was divorced with three kids and we grew up with uh, five kids, four older brothers. What was the community like in Rhodesia? You know, it, it was initially it was actually quite large. We we certainly had uh, the three different sections with the synagogues. You had the your, your Sephardic, your Ashkenazi, and then the Reform. And given our uh, mix of family heritage at that time, we joined the Reform. And my parents were very instrumental in getting the uh, synagogues up and started up there. Uh, all my brothers were Bamitzford, and I was the first one to be but mitzvahed in our in our families at all. What city were so, you living in? In Salisbury, now called Harare. Mm -hmm. And is that where you spent your time before coming to the United States, or did you go elsewhere? From Rhodesia in the late 70s, when the political unrest was uh, rearing its head, it was time for us to move. So my parents my oldest brother, Rob, older brother Rob, and his wife, Joy, my nephew, Craig, my brother, Trevor, and I made Aliyah to Israel, where we lived for three years prior to coming over here to the States. My oldest brother moved to South Africa, and my second oldest brother came directly over here to Richardson, Texas, to be with uh, his birth father and the rest of our family that were living here at the time. And where did you live in Israel? First of all, I was, uh, we were all on the Ulpan together in Ashkelon, mm -hmm. and then we all moved into the uh, Jewish Federation, South African building, in um, just outside of Tel Aviv. So, How old were you at the time? Uh, when I first went over there, I was 19. And before moving to Tel Aviv, I'm sorry, we stayed in uh, Rishon LeZion mm -hmm. as well. How and, did you like it in Israel? You know, I was young, it was a little bit difficult to learning the language. When we were uh, at the Ulpan, it was, uh, you know, initially it was fun sitting next to my parents and seeing my dad at the age of 60 odd going up to the blackboard and, and writing in Hebrew the, the alphabet. You know, then afterwards I thought about it and also felt very sad that that was the time that I'm thinking they should have been retiring, thinking about, you know, the easy life. And yet there they were starting absolutely fresh again in Israel with everything very hard. I think inflation was probably the biggest issue. We never knew what the cost of anything was going to be day to day. They never put pricing up in the little corner stores 
because it depended on how much the eggs were that morning when they were delivered, depending on how much the bread was that morning. So at the end of any given day, you never know if you, you could afford anything that day or not. So I think for me that was probably one of the hardest things. And then of course missing my family and friends back home. So uh, I took solace in sports mm -hmm. and I got to represent the country of Israel in field hockey. And I was uh, in the Maccabi Games and it was in 1979 or 1980. And you were and how, represented what, Israel. What was your age at the time? Um, 19 or 20. So would, would you not have been eligible for the draft at that time? No, I had been married. I was oh, married oh, at the time. Married I was time. married. I got a divorce in Israel. Uh -huh. So um, neither of my brothers were not eligible either uh -huh. because uh, of their age. Even though we're all in our you know, late teens and 20s, my youngest nephew was born in Israel. Uh -huh. And then when they came over here to the States, he's never been back, but he would have been um, taken into the, the military if he'd gone back, I believe. It's up to the age of 25 uh -huh. for him. So uh, he, hasn't, uh, he has not been back. So I'd love to have gone into the military. I would have liked that experience. So, so when you came here, you were how old? When I came here, I was from Israel, I moved back to live in South Africa, in Johannesburg. Oh, you did? I did. And then a friend and myself backpacked around Europe for a year. I was experiencing that, and I came to America in 1984 or 85. Came over to see my brother Mike and my brother Rob, who were living here. Both father was living here with his wife and his, his children. And I had no intention of staying here. While I was here, they changed my passport from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe Rhodesia, the country changed name, which meant I was stateless because nobody recognized the country of Rhodesia because we had sanctions put against us uh, from the British back in the 60s. So when we decided to make Aliyah to Israel, it was one of the few countries in the world that would openly accept us because of Rhodesian passport, because we had the right to make Aliyah, so the law called the Law of Return. Mm -hmm. If you're Jewish, you can automatically go back there. So the fact that we had Rhodesian passports didn't mean anything, thank goodness, mm -hmm. to the uh, Israeli government. So, but you came here? Came here for a vacation. Uh -huh. Came here for vacation. My country changed its name, which means I lost my passport, so I didn't have anything to travel or leave the country with. Applied for uh, residency and citizenship here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, my whole family lived in Richardson. Uh -huh. We all lived with each other and close across the street from each other and back to back with each other. And I applied for and received my residency. And about nine years after that, I became an American citizen. And I love Texas. <laughs> and what, what did you do uh, for a living when you came here? When I arrived here, I was, I was able-bodied. I was not in a wheelchair. I had several jobs and that's uh, the wonderful gift about Texas is it is the right to work state. I was a videographer, a video technician. I did uh, birth, the um, video, the births of uh, children, babies. I did bar mitzvahs, I did weddings, I did funerals. Did all of that as well as all major sporting events involved in the video industry. I was also a paramedic and I was a master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming. Oh. So I was able to I was able to participate in all those different jobs seven days a week to, to make ends meet because leaving Rhodesia you come with nothing. Just whatever's you, whatever you're wearing and a few items in your suitcase. What type so, of education had you had prior to coming? I completed high school. We had the British schooling at the time which would be probably the equivalent of M level. Um, so it's high school graduation and one year of college. I'd also gone to for back in the day, secretarial school, mm -hmm. and um, then I'd also been a nurse's aide when I was back there. That enabled me to get my paramedics when I was over here. So. Okay. So, when did life change for you? Well, I, I guess I've had several life-changing events in my life. One of them would be, you know, leaving the country, the only country I'd known, and language that I knew and my family and, and making Aliyah to Israel, and even though I had my direct family with me, it's still, um, it's, it's very interesting wanting to integrate into a society 
when you don't speak the language, understand the culture, the innuendos. So that was that was probably one of them. And then in uh, 22696 in February the 26th, um, I was broadsided by a vehicle in Dallas on my way to work, and which resulted in a brain injury, left side paralysis, impaired vision, hearing, uh, rods and screws in my back and my neck, and uh, so that was that was very life changing. I was very active. I was working several jobs. Um, you know, I was at that point in my life where I was committed to help my parents at that point because they were now also over here with us in, in the States. Everybody made Aliyah, after we made Aliyah to Israel over three to five year period, the rest of my family came over to Richardson. So, you know, in, in 96 I was, you know, at that point where I was working, I had a house and it was now to my turn to, to start giving back to my parents. I was helping them, taking them out, doing all their paperwork and then suddenly the whole thing was reversed again. At the age of 35, I was having to get my mom and my friends and my family to come in and, and bath me and brush my hair and clean my teeth and make decisions for me, tell me what I'd eat that day, where I'd go that day. Um, I lost the uh, ability to drive because they have no sense of humor here in Texas. They won't let you drive without a driver's <laughs> license or insurance. So, <laughs> so that, was, that, was, um, that was very tough um, for about 18 months. They told my parents, you know, put me in a nursing home. I'd never do anything for myself ever again. I would never walk, talk, make my own decisions, uh, sit up straight. My parents knew I'd played sport for Rhodesia. I'd represented Israel, that I had a, a, the attitude that if anybody could get through this, then poss possibly I could. An amazing support from family and friends and extended family. And a friend came over one day and said, you know, I've heard about this place called Equest in Wiley, Texas, and they offer therapy riding on horses. And uh, perhaps it, that was something you'd like to do. And I got really excited thinking, oh, that would be so much fun, a day out the house, you know. Now I'd ridden the camel in Israel, but that didn't help me one little bit. <laughs> so I went out to Equest and I had the most amazing um, coaches and people out at Equest who helped me to get physically stronger, mentally stronger, emotionally stronger by using the horse as a modality to enable me to uh, do my therapy. And it was through that that I started to be able to sit up straight and get rid of my neck brace and my back brace and all the different aids that I had. And even though I'm still in a wheelchair, I can stand now and I can take some steps. So I started competing on borrowed horses and I've represented the United States and been to two Paralympic trials. and. Uh, yeah, Equest definitely was a, a life changer for me after my life life changing event, which uh, I refer to as my opportunity. And I see you have a book in front of you. Tell I us do. about the book. I'm excited. I'm excited. It's just just been published. Basically, it's a story of where I came from in Africa, uh, making Aliyah to Israel, coming over to America as able bodied and um, working all the different jobs that I had. But more importantly, the re most of the book is made up of interesting stories and positive influences in my life and positive outcomes I've had, a lot of which are very funny. It's mostly short stories that you can pick up and put down, but mostly about seeing life differently, enjoying each and every day. You know, and I think, I think that's something I learned while I was in Israel. There's a lot of people in Israel, especially in the military, that have to live their life day to day. And they have this incredible zest for life. And I really think that's where I learned that and carried it through with me. So, yeah, the, my, this is my book, One Brain Injury Will Change Your Mind. But mostly it's funny stories and poignant stories. And I think anybody, you know, be there challenged or in a wheelchair or walking around, everybody can read it and enjoy it and then get something out of it. So I'm very excited to uh, be able to publish that. That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. So at this point in your life, um, how do you spend your days? Well, I volunteer a lot at Equest, which is the therapeutic school with which I'm associated that gave me such a gift of being able to ride. I also handle a lot of paperwork for my brother, I have a, a brother who's three years older than me, um, who is mentally challenged. 
and yet he is magnificent. He lives on his own and he works, but he doesn't read very well. So I handle all his banking and medical insurance and paperwork for him. So a lot of my time is taken up with that, uh, at volunteering at other organizations and uh, spend time with my family. I've got a very large family now here in around the Dallas Metroplex. So my, my days are busy. My days and nights are very, very busy. Is there anything in particular that you miss um, from your life in Rhodesia? You know, coming from Rhodesia, and in, in retrospect, we were extremely spoiled and very sheltered. And I think some of the things that I miss is that everything closed down at a certain time on the weekend, which meant that you couldn't go out and get petrol or gas. Uh, you couldn't go shopping, you couldn't go banking after about noon on a Saturday, which left the whole rest of Saturday afternoon to play sport, Saturday night to go out with friends, and then Sunday to all stay at home and, and have family connections. So I, I miss those large um, holidays, you know, the Rosh Hashanahs and the Pesachs, and, with the family, and it's such a large family, my, my grandparents, and you know, over the past uh, ten and a half years, my, uh, my dad, John, and my mom have both passed away, and um, just recently, I, we lost my brother in August of 2014. He passed away. So uh, I think the big family gatherings is, is possibly some of the things that I, I really miss the most, and the freedom we had then. The country is not the same anymore. So um, I was back there in 2013 for my uncle's 80th birthday, and it was so exciting, just wonderful. I went back with uh, my partner Tammy and I went back. My brother sent us back four days before his birthday. Just got on the, on the plane and we arrived there the night before his birthday, and it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful event to be there and celebrate his life. Were there any particular foods that were special to the culture there that were that we might not have here or might not be accustomed to? Right. Yeah. There's a there's a particular sausage which is a South African sausage called borovos. So I really miss miss having that. And it just looks like a regular thick sausage. It's that's really very very nice. The pies they made there, meaning the the savory pies like the beef pie or the potato and peas. I, I miss some of that. Of course, the local one of the local uh, foods for the for the black Africans is something called sadza, which is a cornmeal, and they mix it up, and it looks like a it looks like a dry mashed potato, and they make a meat sauce with it, and then you take the if there's a big bowl of it in the middle of the table, and you take it with your hands, you roll it up, and you dip it, and then you eat it. Oh my, my mouth's watering just thinking about it. <laughs> and I, I think another thing that I miss a lot is that. My mom's sister's husband, my mom's sister's Lila Capaluto and her husband Salva Capaluto, his mother used to make the most fantastic Jewish food that down the generations we've never been able to repeat. The rashikas and the pastelikus and all the things that our, our tongue hangs out for. And no matter how much we've tried, I think the interpretation of the foods we got in Africa and bringing them over here, the recipes are not the same. Even when you play with them, there's something about food that's made with a mother's love. It does not an ingredient that's purchased, it just, it's there. And yes, I miss that. I miss my parents very much. But you, you still have some family left there, it sounds like, some cousins perhaps? Correct. I have two cousins that live in South Africa, in Johannesburg. One's married with two children, the other one's unmarried. That's Fortune Capaluto and Linda Capaluto. I have a brother, Stan, and his wife, Sheila, who live in Cape Town. They have two children and um, a son and a daughter. And the son has one son, that's my great nephew. And then the daughter has a son and a, a daughter. And then um, my aunt and uncle still live in Zimbabwe. They were farmers back there and they just felt they were too old to leave and didn't know if they could make it with, you know, because you leave with nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think my parents came to Israel with my two brothers, sister-in-law, nephew, and myself and my ex-husband. Um, that was the good supportive team that we had over there. Mm -hmm. And then came over here to the States, all of over to Richardson. And the family's grown. I have a, uh, my brother Rob and his wife Joy have two sons. 
The oldest son, Craig Lewin, and his wife, Misty, have four children. Uh, the oldest, who will be bar mitzvahed probably in a year and a half. So it'll be the first bar mitzvah of that generation, which will be very exciting. And um, his other son and his wife, that's Adam, and his wife is Arielle. They have a son who's two and a half, and they just had a daughter um, on Sunday. Oh, so it's just oh, wonderful yeah. extensions. And we all live around the Plano, uh, Dallas area and get to see each other on, on all the holidays. And it's, uh, it's wonderful. It's that big family feeling once again. And because one of my nephews was born in Israel and one was born in Rhodesia, there's a lot of traditions from each country that we bring together to celebrate all the holidays here together in Israel. I mean, in Israeli holidays here in Dallas, <laughs> in Richardson or Plano. So. Is there anything else that I might not have asked you that you think you, would be important for your family to know in terms of your legacy, what you'd like to tell them about your, your, your life, your history, your family history, things that you would like them to remember about you? I, I think if we go all the way back to you, my grandparents, um, Max and Essie Cohen, and my parents, Margaret and John Lewin, something that was always instilled in us is to, you know, always see the good in others and appreciate the others. And when I came to Dallas, I had a very hard time. I found a lot more anti-Semitism than I'd ever experienced in my life. I was very surprised at that. And, you know, my dad would always say, you have to understand that if, if some people are just ignorant, they don't know, they don't know you to hate you or they don't know you to dislike you. And so I always carry that on and, you know, it's like use education if it's possible to educate the person about my religion, about my lifestyle, style, where I come from, uh, even to educate people on why I'm in a wheelchair because there has been so many times where I'd be in a supermarket and I'd be walked down, going down the aisle and people would grab their kids like there was something wrong because I was in a wheelchair. So definitely, you know, they, our parents instilled in us the ability to communicate and speak with people and accept where they're coming from with the idea of sharing what you have and perhaps, you know, letting them see both sides of the story. And I think that's been instilled in my brother's kids as well that live here in, uh, in Dallas. And I think that's very important because I think it would be very easy when someone is against you for whatever reason to automatically be against them. Um, but my, my parents did, did instill that in us and, and wanted us to, to be the best that we could be and share. And just because that person, other people may not like us, didn't mean we couldn't like ourselves and be proud of who we were, be proud of being Jewish, being proud of coming from Africa, being proud to be American citizens. So, and I think that's gone down the next generations and I see the way my nephews are teaching that to their children. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Well, thank you so much. It's been a delight speaking with oh, you today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for including me. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate okay. it. We really appreciate thank your you. time. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I have a. Qu I actually have a question. That's, sure. That's um, so. You know, the ignorance of Americans is that we know very little about the rest of the world most of the time. Right. Um, do you have any sense of how your upbringing or your, your Jewish life in Rhodesia compared, say, to South Africa or to um, any of the other country, you know, similar countries? Was it, was it a smaller population and therefore people were closer and more likely to be related or or um there was very, in Rhodesia at the time there was actually a large Jewish population a lot of people came over uh, from the second world war from places like Russia and um uh, like my dad's parents from Poland they they came over there was there was very significant differences in the in the Ashkenazi Jewish families and the Sephardic Jewish families. And when we went over to the Reform uh, Synagogue, my oldest brother married a woman who converted. So that was 
possibly one of the things that may have gotten my parents to get so involved in that because it was more accepting for all of us. We were all able to sit together, all the men and the women sat together as opposed to being separated. So that was, to me, I think that was more of a family bonding. I went to a Jewish day school when I was there. My brothers didn't, being the only girl, they went to regular uh, public schools. I went to a Jewish elementary school. So that was exciting. Something I've noticed, interestingly, um, is that some of the perhaps sayings that we had back there within the Jewish religion and some of the traditional things that we did as Jewish families were not done in Israel and then have not been done over here in America either. So for example, when a, when a person passes away, and I wish I could remember, know where this comes from, and perhaps somebody can enlighten me, we always said long life to the family. Right. And when I've said that to people who originate perhaps from Africa, from Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, or from South Africa, they understand. When I say it to people in America, they're like, okay, thank you, but they don't have a clue to the Jewish neighborhood over here. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how some of those traditions may have become uh, ingrained in us within the Jewish religion. I don't know if it was an African influence in that, that we carried it forward. Um, it was just something we accepted and after my grandparents passed away and then after dad passed away, you know, 10, 11 years ago, now I wish I'd, I didn't know enough then to ask that it, where it came from because it was just, we just did it. It's just what everybody did and I had no clue that other people didn't do it. So. <laughs> You know, and now that mom's also passed, I mean, I do have reference from my mom's sister, Auntie Lila, in Zimbabwe, and I'm not sure of something that's Jewish related. They help me, to, you know, fill, the, fill in the gaps for that. Um, did you find among the people you knew that families came to Rhodesia to work in a certain area? You know, did they come as farmers or did they come because it was similar? Or was it just a place that Jews could come and they found whatever right. I, I, kind of life they had? I believe it would be probably whatever work they could find at the time. My dad, John's family came out and I think they may even come on a boat to South Africa. And then there was work available up north because we're on the border of South Africa is Rhodesia. Right. And uh, that they were able to get work doing that. My Dad's father worked in a convenience store. Um, I think, wow. you know, the, the people back then really understood the idea of working and getting bread on the table and a roof over their family's head. And that was very important. My mom's grandparents, and I'm not sure how, my brother may be able to fill in the historical side of that, how they went to Portuguese East Africa, which was where my mom was born, and they got got very involved in the synagogues over there as caretakers and my great uncle Stanley and my great grandfather got involved in the art of glass making. I don't know how or where, I think that had a Russian, Jewish Russian influence on them because their parents would have been from Russia originally. And they took that art of glass making and went all the way, including to India, and they placed all the mirrors in the Taj Mahal back in the day. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, perhaps that was just a, a metaphor for us to uh, see our reflection and, and, and love who we are and like who we are. That's a fabulous story. Yeah, it I'm is. going to be interviewing Rob, so we'll find out more about Yeah, he's the, he's the historian, you know, since, since the brain injury, I. I don't remember a lot of things that perhaps could be useful for a video like this. I can only remember what I can remember. No, but you've remembered so, so much about yourself and you have oh. such a wonderful story to tell. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to donate this book to, to the library. Wonderful. Uh, so I'll move. sign it if you like. That'd be great. Uh, so I'd that be glad be to fabulous. donate that. I bought that to give to you guys for that. Thank oh, that's so much. great. You're welcome. Thank We're you. Well, thanks for including me. It's been wonderful. Thank you it's so a great much. legacy to leave to the kids and oh, great nephews and nieces. Yeah. And